Hi, this is Dale Peterson, and welcome to the Unsolicited Response Show. In this episode, I'll be talking with ZDI about Pwn to Own Miami. That occurred at S420 down in Miami South Beach. And ZDI awarded almost $300,000, 300K, to researchers who found and exploited vulnerabilities in ICS applications and devices. But before we get to that, I wanted to talk just a little bit here before I bring them on about when vulnerabilities are important and when they're unimportant to an ICS asset owner and vendor. Now, from an asset owner perspective, they are vulnerabilities are unimportant if the system is insecure by design. And I know longtime listeners have heard me define this for a long time, but insecure by design is not just a lack of secure by design. When I say something is insecure by design, it means that you are able, an attacker is able to do everything they want through a documented feature or function. So they don't need to find some vulnerability to exploit the system. So for example, if you have unauthenticated firmware upload, it really doesn't matter if there's any other, any other vulnerabilities in the system. Another example would be uh, being able to reprogram logic without authentication. It's primarily a lack of authentication that leads to an insecure by design device, but it could also be backdoors or other things. So imagine you have a device that is insecure by design. If I'm an asset owner, why do I care about patching a vulnerability in a device that can be fully exploited every way an attacker would want without that vulnerability? I haven't really reduced my risk by patching an insecure by design by patching an insecure by design device. Another example would be where I wouldn't care if I was an asset owner would be, let's say I have a device or a system or an application that has a large number of known and unknown vulnerabilities. So if a device has a hundred vulnerabilities, maybe an extreme number, but in some cases it's close to that, what good am I really doing by patching one of those vulnerabilities? You know, I still have 99 other ones that I could exploit. So you kind of have to make your decision as an asset owner. Are you patching this device? Are you patching this cyber asset or are you not? Partial patching typically will get you little. Um, and then I really think a lot of times what we're seeing with this emphasis on patching insecure by design and, and quite frankly, insecure by choice systems is you're getting a lot of activity. You can say, oh, I'm doing monthly or bi-monthly or quarterly patching, but you're really not getting risk reduction. It, it is another version of security theater. Now, patching for asset owners can be important. Um, a couple of cases that I think you should really think about. When the vulnerability that is out there that has the patch available is exploitable through the security perimeter from a less trusted zone. So let's say this is a historian that's accessible from the enterprise network, and there's a hole in the firewall to allow access to that historian on a specific port, and that access would allow someone to exploit the vulnerability. Well, in that case, that's a hugely important, that's a hugely important patch to apply. Um, another one would be kind of the opposite of what I said before. If you have a system that is in a relatively secure and hardened state that would be very difficult to exploit, and it's just missing a patch or two patches, well, then that patch becomes important because you're actually changing the risk equation. So from an asset owner perspective, a competition like Pwn to Own maybe isn't as important as it is to a vendor. So let's look at when patches are important to a vendor. Now, I would actually like to say always, they always should be important to a vendor. But really, they're only important if the vendor is selling a device that can be secured for its purpose. And we have seen some vendors, when vulnerabilities are reported, just flat out say their device never will be secure, that they have no plan on fixing it, it's either an old device or they say it just was never for that purpose, that it was only supposed to be used in secure zones. Now, 
I will have probably my second least favorite term usually applies after that. My least favorite term is cyber hygiene. The next up is holistic. So what will usually happen if the vendor says we're not going to fix it, they'll say, well, you should take a holistic approach and don't worry about our system being or our cyber asset or our, our application being insecure. You should just apply a holistic approach and then you will be safe. Then you will be secure. Um, I would say the another area where vulnerabilities are important is for awareness sometimes. So we've done things like Project Basecamp with PLCs where we just showed all the problems they had. Um, Billy Rios, Terry McCorkle years ago did 100 plus HMI vulns in a month where they just showed all these HMIs just had no thought about security. And there's occasionally demonstrative efforts in different sectors like in maritime or in, we're seeing a lot now in healthcare to raise awareness. And there's some value in that, not necessarily that the asset owner can do anything about it, but at least this puts the vendor on notice that, hey, maybe you need to start rethinking what you're doing for security. But now the exciting area that kind of leads into pwn to own is that we're finally starting to get some ICS applications and devices that were developed under an SDL that's been in place for maybe five or more years and they were designed to be secure. And this is where you really get value for highly talented researchers to actually try to exploit these systems that have a chance of resisting their exploitation. So this could be done, for example, hiring a third party. My company, Digital Bond, used to do that work. We don't do that anymore. But you can go to IOActive and a variety of other people, and they will actually test the system for the vendor, kind of a third party assessment. If that vendor thought it was a secure system and had an SDL, that's worthwhile. And the other approach is what we're going to talk about today. This could be bug bounties, either by the vendor themselves or by a third party, or it could be a competition like Pwn to Own Miami. And now that we finally have some, I'd say some ICS applications and assets that could possibly stand up to these efforts, it's worthwhile to put them through their paces. So we were thrilled to bring this to the ICS community at S420. So with that as my little monologue, I want to get now to my interview on Pwn to Own Miami with ZDI. And at the end of the interview, if you stay put after we say our goodbyes, there's a five minute video that uh, the ZDI team put together on day three, the final day of Pwn to Own. It's quite interesting if you want to see a firsthand view. So here's the interview. Joining me from the Zero Day Initiative, ZDI, is Brian Gorentz and Abdul Aziz Hariri. Uh, they were both involved in putting on the Pwn to Own Miami last year, and we're going to talk a little bit about this. But let me give them a little more of an introduction. Brian is the Senior Director of Vulnerability Research with Trend Micro. Brian leads the Zero Day Zero Day Initiative, ZDI, which represents the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. Abdul Aziz Hariri is a senior manager of vulnerability analysis in ZDI, and he actually ran the execution part of Pwn to Own Miami. So guys, welcome to the show. How's it going? Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Well, you know, I'm well aware of ZDI <laughs> and Pwn to Own, obviously, from pre S4 and for what you did at the S420 event. But Brian, I think it might be a good way to start to just give the audience a little bit of an idea of what ZDI does and maybe why it does it. Yeah. Yeah. So like you, like you said, we're the world's largest vendor agnostic bug bounty program. But what does that actually mean? That means that uh, we work with researchers around the world. And when they discover zero day vulnerabilities and pieces of software while they're fuzzing or looking at the code, um, they, they work with us to actually disclose that vulnerability to the vendor. Uh, and in exchange for that information, we actually compensate them with, uh, with cash to, uh, to, to, to make sure that they, uh, they keep on looking for vulnerabilities. But it, it's a little bit different than, you know, than the, like the traditional bug bounties of service companies like HackerOne and BugCrowd. Like what we do is we actually focus on the, on buying vulnerabilities and exploits in software that our customers want protection from. 
So what we'll do is, you know, we're basically look in the open market uh, for people offering vulnerabilities and they submit them to us and, and we analyze them and then we make a determination of whether we're going to buy them or not. So that means we can pick the best and uh, research out there in the world and, and bring it in-house into Trend Micro. And what we do is we actually reverse engineer uh, how that vulnerability works, how the, how the exploit, um, you know, uh, is how you would write an exploit against that vulnerability so that we can build protections against that in the Trend Micro product lines. And what products would this go into, this, this information that you're finding? Where would this end up? Yeah, so a lot of the zero-day intelligence makes it into the, the tipping point intrusion prevention system that, that uh, Trend Micro sells. Um, but we also build a lot of that intelligence and deploy it out to other products within the company. Um, you know, deep security, we, 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 uh, we, we feed intelligence into uh, TX1. Um, our SCADA solution actually gets uh, some of the intelligence uh, that, that we develop. Um, a lot of the products in Trend Micro, you know, we try to, you know, uh, make sure that, you know, a lot of this intelligence makes it in there so that we can build protections against, you know, either the vulnerability itself for the exploitation of that vulnerability. And then Abdul, you're involved with Pwn to Own. What is the role of Pwn to Own then as part of this mission that CDI has? So, um, you know, vulnerabilities and bugs are, are great to see, right? To fix vulnerabilities in, in application software. Uh, but in order, uh, but to see those being used, um, weaponized in an actual exploit and demonstrated, that's something else. It provides us with uh, with you know innovation innovative ways of how these vulnerabilities are used in an actual exploit. Um, the whole contest pwn to own is is basically made to mimic the offensive market. Um, we do offer lar large amount of bounty specifically to see those vulnerabilities being exploited on one of the toughest um, targets. Let's say browsers, phones, um, IoT devices. And, and basically, it, it provides us with, with knowledge and, and basically mitigation bypasses and uh, certain techniques of how these vulnerabilities can be used in a re real world scenario um, and how they can be uh, chained with each other in order to provide a fully working exploit. Mm. Uh, and I guess so, are, are, the bound, or are the awards, the cash awards larger in Pwn to Own um, yeah. than you would typically get if you just submitted something to ZDI? Yeah, for sure. Uh, Pwn to own prices are um, are always larger than uh, the normal bounty, um, uh, you know, prices that we offer through ZDI, specifically because of the amount of work that's involved in actually writing the actual exploits, um, uh, breaking certain mitigations, chaining things together. It's 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 a little bit more complicated when it comes to finding a vulnerability versus writing an actual working exploit. Um, so yeah, and in a nutshell, yes, the prices are higher at Pwn to own than the normal program prices. And, and you also have this element, this suspense with the time pressure there too, right? So these people get on stage, they have, what, three minutes or so to actually s prove that they can achieve this exploit. So it's not like they have days and they can just send you the information afterwards. They have to show it live working. Correct. Uh, it's quite a bit of excitement to the whole thing. Correct. Yeah. They have to have a fully working exploit, well-engineered one, uh, so it wouldn't fail from the first attempt. Um, and that exploit has to work within five minutes or five else minutes. it's okay. good. Yeah. And they have three attempts. Um, each attempt is five minutes. Um, so, yeah. And then, Brian, this is, you know, the history of Pwn Own. You've been doing it now for 10 years. You had an event in Vancouver um, that's been going on since then that that dealt with browsers and other sorts of things. Maybe you can just go over the Vancouver and the, the mobile event a little bit before we talk about the ICS event. Yeah, sure. Initially, when we started Pwn to Own, you know, we were we were focused on on kind of browser exploitation and, and and operating system exploitation. So we have two other events that we do throughout the year: Pwn to Own Vancouver and Pwn to Own Tokyo. Vancouver is typically in March, April timeframe, and Tokyo is in October, so, you know, November timeframe. And we kind of split up the technologies that we put in each one of these contests. So in the Vancouver event, uh, our focus is browsers, operating systems, virtualization technology, um, and enterprise applications. Right. And so what we 
look for people to bring, you know, some of the best exploits in the world uh, for like breaking out of, you know, virtual machines and executing code on the host and doing things like that, kind of that really advanced stuff. Mm -hmm. um, you know, that, and we're probably now most famous for in the Vancouver event, the actual addition of, of Tesla, right? We've, yeah. we've been partnering with cool. Tesla that now for the last couple of years to bring exploits against the vehicle itself. Um, and then in the Tokyo event, we focused, uh, it started out as a mobile event. And so we were looking for exploits against mobile devices. Um, and we were looking for, you know, baseband exploits and MMS messaging exploits and things like that to show up at the event. And as IoT devices became more and more popular, we decided that's the appropriate event to actually run, uh, to, to put consumer IoT devices in. Uh, and mm -hmm. so that's now where we have like home routers and cameras and, uh, you know, um, uh, and, and NAS and, and all sorts of other consumer devices that we bring into the event. And you know, we did that one actually just recently in uh, in November. Uh, had lots of entries into the the contest for those different devices. And another interesting area of of, of very research nowadays. And then we in January 2020, we put up the little logo there. You introduced Pondo in Miami with a focus on ICS, which was very exciting. We were excited to to host you at the event, but you guys ran the whole competition. Um, and so you, you moved into the ICS world. We had ICS targets. And I know that ZDI and the Pwn to Own have always been controversial. As they entered a new area, there was, you know, some people, why are you doing this? This is bad. This is only helping the bad guys. Or, you know, why are we <laughs> encouraging people to make money doing these sorts of things? Uh, and, and then the market matures and, and they understand more of the purpose. What was your feeling, Brian, about the ICS community, the vendors and the asset owners in this? Did they, were they, because we're known as a conservative group, did they mm -hmm. accept this or did they repel against it? I'm, I'm sure there was a little of both, but how would you characterize it? Yeah, it was quite interesting because when we when we started the event, we 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 you know Abdul and I were concerned. Like you know, obviously this is that's the perception of of the ICS space is that they were you know a conservative group. It was going to be a little bit standoffish for the event, and you know this is something that's you know very very kind of aggressive um, in in the way that it's presented. So, but we actually found the vendors uh, to be actually quite welcoming. Um, it was actually a, a very nice experience. Like many of the vendors actually provided us licenses and support mm -hmm. for the comp test itself, helped us understand how to properly set up the environment to put the most representative system up for like, you know, what a real world use case would look like. Um, and I do want to acknowledge a couple of the vendors who really kind of stood out at, the, at, the, at, at this inaugural Pwned Own competition, which would be Rockwell Automation, um, Inductive Automation, and OPC Foundation for, for you know, really working with us uh, throughout the uh, throughout the the, not only prior to the event, but pr uh, during the event and during as part of the disclosure process. I know Abdul was working, you know, heavily with the vendors as part of the setup. I don't know if you wanted to provide any extra, uh, uh, any extra color there, Abdul. Sure. Um, when it comes uh, from a software perspective, Rockwell provided us with with VMs uh, running the applications, uh, target applications, and that was very helpful for us, at least from a setup perspective and running the contest. And for the researchers as well, who were who wanted to participate and find vulnerabilities, so we provided these VMs to the researchers, um, and basically to 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 do some some research on them. Um, Triangle Microworks and Schneider Electric also provided us with licenses um, for this for the software that we needed uh, to use in the in the in the, uh, the contest. Well, that's very encouraging that the vendors. Uh, got involved and and many of them sent people to the event as well, right? To discuss anything that was found. Yeah, I mean that's one of the values of the contest itself is when like a, when the, when the vendor actually participates in the contest, they send people out because there's an opportunity there after the event ha after the you know the entry is done and it's been successful in in front of you know the audience. Um, there's actually an opportunity for the vendor to go back and actually talk to the researcher and and judge the entry itself. Uh, to determine whether it is in fact a true zero day and it meets all the rules and learn from them and, and the approach that they took to their research and maybe try to apply some of that internally uh, back at the shop, right? So that's, you know, some of the value of participating in the contest and being involved in the contest, you know, um, you know, and also helps you, you know, uh, release patches uh, quickly. So like inductive automation, for example, um, you know, they, they, they sent, had a team there of people who are ready to accept the vulnerabilities and they actually released the, the first patch of the contest, like the day after the contest was over. Uh, you know, that so was you impressive. Can, yeah. So you can, you know, you can see the vendors that are, you know, kind of actively involved in the research community and how serious they take it and, you know, how fast they're actually able to release patches 
coaches and learn from the from the contest. I mean, that's the whole point of the event is to actually build the fences. Ultimately, um, mm -hmm. there is a show obviously involved and a game involved for the contestants, but in the end, it's going so I guess we've held people in suspense long enough. Abdul, why don't you give us a little breakdown, you know, numbers of exploits found, number of competitors, amount of money made by the competitors and such. Give us a rundown sure. of the event. Sure. Um, so the, the contest, the, the, the first ICS contest that we ran, definitely exceeded the expectations. Um, in fact, that was one of the biggest point on contests that we've ever ran. Uh, funny enough, uh, Brian and I, we always, uh, you know, have a little bit of concern whether or not we're, we're going to have participation, some participation, any participation. Um, in this case, we've had eight teams participating uh, from Europe, from the States, from Israel. Um, they all participated in 25 attempts, which is one of the highest number of attempts that we've had uh, in a contest ever. Um, We've had full wins, we've had partial wins, we, we had failed attempts, uh, you name it. So we had all the drama. Going on. <laughs> um, the total payout was almost $300,000, which is excellent, um, for a total of 30 vulnerabilities, which is, which is also a high number of vulnerabilities received in a point to own contest. We had five categories uh, with eight different targets. Um, so in total, it was a very, very good contest. Um, for us so it definitely exceeded uh, the expectations it, it's one of the biggest contests that we've ever ran and we had a variety of targets right we had we had hmis engineering workstations uh opc kind of a historian sort of sort of thing so there was a variety of things so a protocol stack the triangle microworks protocol stack uh, we'll have the list up there so people can see all the targets uh, we didn't have any PLCs or any level one devices in the system. And, and I think that's just difficult to do. <laughs> it's, yeah. it's, you know, for, logistically, you can't send a PLC to everyone, but I guess you can't send a Tesla to everyone as well. Um, Brian, do you have any, any thoughts about how you would do that in the future, if at all? Yeah, I think in the future now, if we, we were partnering with some some of the vendors again, you know, we could look at trying to provide out some PLCs to parties that we know to be interested in the contest. I mean, that's effectively what we did with, with the Tesla. We gave people, you know, uh, development systems that they could look at and poke and prod around. And obviously, you know, it's uh, uh, it can be quite challenging to get hardware, especially in, in the PLC world. Some of that stuff is, you know, purchase only. And, um, and so, but, you know, when we do provide that type of hardware, we're able to, um, you know, you're able to catch some some of the vulnerabilities that uh, that are going to be easily found. So I think that, um, you know, I think it's worth, you know, at least we're exploring that the next time we run this contest, trying to get some of the PLCs uh, that to, to, to contestants, you know, and see what they can bring. You know, there's a lot of really good embedded reverse engineers out there yeah. who are going to be able to find bugs that, you know, norm would slip through the normal development process. Now, I'm curious just, and you can never know this, but of the so you had you said about was it about 25 contestants was it or no 25 attempts eight attempts. or ten could eight okay. eight teams uh, eight teams and 25 attempts in total and do you think do you ever have any feel abdul in terms of how many people are trying that don't come that you know are, are there 100 people and then eight find something and come or is it usually a one-to-one -one match there um I don't think we can measure it that way. Um, I can tell you that basically we've had a lot of uh, a, a lot of people asking about the contest and how they can participate in the contest. Um, but in the end, uh, since it's, it, I'm sure there's a lot of people that actually wanted to come to the contest but couldn't actually fly to Miami, for example, or, or something okay. like that. Um, so uh, some some people might want to, want wanted to actually participate and they couldn't because of travel reasons or anything like that. Um, but in the end, whoever was able to, to travel, that's the first thing. And the second thing to pull off actual exploits working, um, basically came to the contest and, and were able to participate. Okay. And it was one thing I found very interesting was I was curious who was going to actually compete in this and was it going to be the traditional ICS researchers I need? I know, you know, we see all the time or whether it was going to be new people in the industry. And I was a bit surprised that it was so many new people. Uh, we did have a few, Ali Abbasi and his team. I was really pleased to see him there because I knew him when he was just a grad student. Really one of the up and coming stars. But 
he and a couple of his university students were there. The Clarity team was there. They're obviously a vendor in this space. Oak Ridge National Lab had a gentleman. Yeah. But those were the only that only three that I recognized of the eight that were actually ICS background. Uh, the winner himself had they. I don't think they had ICS background, did they? No, the Insight team. You know, I, they they kind of research across the board. I mean, they're actually a, a, at the time a heavy submitter into the ZDI program itself. Um, and so, you know, when when you look back at the contest and you kind of think about who was going to participate, we actually expected to have a lot of new new participation and a lot of people outside of the ICS space because a lot of these products are kind of built on technologies like Windows and Java and .NET, and they're all kind of well researched outside of the ICS world. And then when you bring in researchers who have spent, you know, years looking at hardened applications in different arenas, and they bring them into a brand new space, the ICS space, you know, it's 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 a it's a nice transition. It's an easy transition for them to come in and start looking for some of that. I mean, if you, you know, a lot, like you were talking about, you know, the the, it, the ICS space can be a little bit slower to move and adopt some of the you know, secure software development lifecycle practices. We see, you know, and we can see this from the program that that we run. The Day initiative, you know, the types of bugs that come into the program. We see, you know, kind of a lack of uh, adoption of some exploit mitigations in the software. So when you when you when you take researchers who have been focused in other areas for a long time and bring them into this new space, you know, they're going to be able to find stuff and, you know, catch some of that low hanging fruit or, 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 you know, quickly identify bugs that people don't normally would find um, as part of a research process. Yeah, I was wondering about that in terms of ZDI in general. Uh, in the SCADA world, uh, or in the ICS world, um, I haven't been in the vulnerability hunting business since probably 2005, so it's been a long time. But a lot of times you just find them by accident when things crash, uh, when you're not even trying to make them crash. So how do you deal with that, not, not just in the competition, but with CDI, when you deal with some of these products, some of these applications that are so fragile? Uh, I would think, is it just based on what you pay for the vulnerabilities or how do you deal with not getting hundreds or thousands of vulnerabilities coming in? Yeah, I think, you know, if we, uh, you know, for, for us, we're actually not, we're not strangers to the ICS space. Um, you know, as part of our normal process in the Zero Day Initiative program, we've, we've bought hundreds of ICS bugs over the years. Um, and, you know, people who focus, you know, their entire, their entire research on, on, uh, you know, ICS products. Um, and so kind of based on that, that experience, we can, we have a pretty good understanding of, you know, what, what's going on in certain, in certain parts of the mm -hmm. attack surface, you know, what it takes to develop, uh, you know, an exploit in the area, what's the strengths, what's the weaknesses of the software. I mean, Abdul, you know, is the person who's in the program responsible for kind of pricing stuff. So, I mean, if you want to go over a little bit of, you know, what's your thoughts on, on pricing those bugs, but, you know, we have, uh, a decent understanding of, of, of what it takes um, based off of just kind of the, the the experience that we have in the program and we and how we apply that to the Pondo contest. And I guess, yeah, and, and pricing would be interesting vis-a-vis -vis maybe some of the other uh, areas that you deal with. Do you find yeah. that you have to lower the prices because of the volume you get or is it pretty equivalent or is it very product <laughs> vendor specific? Any, any thoughts you have on that, Abdul? Um, so yeah, you mentioned something very interesting, which is lowering the price based on the volume. If um, if if a researcher found fifty bugs in in a specific software, we cannot pay, let's say, for example, a specific high price for fifty vulnerabilities mm -hmm. um, in that software. So yeah, definitely the the price has to has to go a little bit lower because of volume, uh, and specifically because that software apparently is not that secure and has a lot of vulnerabilities. Um, when it comes to specific vendors uh, versus other vendors, yes, we do have uh, better pricing for specific vendors because we know that basically um, their code is mature enough. Um, they they pass things on time. Um, they have mitigations embedded, so we we know which vendor is is uh, you know the products of which vendor is a little bit better than the other and stuff like that based on the experience that we have in analyzing massive volumes of vulnerabilities in different applications. And, and on the Pwn to Own, Abdul, on the Pwn to Own Miami contest, uh, of the vulnerabilities that you found, I think there were 30 you mentioned, if I got the numbers right. Correct. Uh, how would you characterize those in terms of sophistication of the, of the team to try to find the vulnerabilities? Were there like 10 that just fell out and 10 that were really harder? How would you characterize that? 
Um, so I would say, so a, lo a lot of the vulnerabilities that we saw at Ponto or Miami were um, the Java component vul vulnerabilities, like deserialization vulnerabilities and, uh, uh, you know, stuff like that. And, and a lot of them were uh, kind of low-hanging food. That's why we saw a lot of partial wins um, mm -hmm. in the contest. Uh, nevertheless, we did see uh, some complicated chains, um, some very nice chains in, in the contest, um, specifically ones from, uh, th there's there's one from Clarity, there's one from um, Tobias and Ali Abbasi, Ali Abbasi's team, the one from uh, Triangle mm -hmm. Microworks. Um, some, of the, some of the chains were pretty complicated uh, basically to exploit. Uh, some of them were very low hanging fruit and, and easy to exploit, uh, like the deserialization bugs and stuff like that. Uh, so in total, uh, we saw we saw different uh, kind of chains. Um, I would say fifty percent were kind of easier than the others, basically to exploit, um, specifically the deserialization ones. Mm. And just uh, I wanted to talk about one of those chains, but when some of this low hanging fruit, when I was watching your summaries, and we'll link to those. You guys put out some great videos on each day of the event. Uh, it was really well done by your team. Uh, I saw that some of them were partial wins because the bugs had been reported before. Were those a lot of the low hanging fruit that you already knew about or, or, or was that across the board things you knew about? Um, so uh, some, so th the way it works is basically if, uh, let's say if, if the first person who runs the attempt um, has, has a legit chain and basically it's not, it's unique. And then uh, the other the other contestant runs his attempt, and then we kind of dupe check against what we saw in the contest and what we have in the in the in our database. It happened that some of these chains, um, we, the, the one of the vendor already knew about it, uh, or had a bug in their database, so that was flagged as a partial. Uh, in other cases, uh, the first uh, the first contestant ran his his exploit chain. The second, third, and fourth contestants actually had the same vulnerability as the first contestant. So that's why we had to flag it as a partial win. Um, yeah. that, that was quite unfortunate, but uh, they were they were all targeting the same components because it was easier to exploit than the other components. And it's easier to find vulnerabilities in these specific components. Mm. And and Brian, I guess that's one of the things that surprised me a little bit, having been new to you know seeing how it works, is when you when the contestant finds a vulnerability it then not only is checked against your database, but you also will ask the vendor, hey, did you know about this? Yeah, and that's, and one, of the, they, that's, one, that's one of the interesting things about Pondo in itself is, is it's a true zero-day conference, right, or contest. What we want to purchase is a zero-day. I mean, there's a lot of end-day vulnerabilities out there that, that exist that people know about. Um, and, but, you know, if we're going to spend as much money as we, we're doing, I mean, we're talking 300, almost $300,000 yeah. for the whole event. We want to be purchasing vulnerabilities that are that are zero-day and unknown. And so that's kind of our the part of our judging process is to go through a deduplication check, you know, of what we know about through the program, what bugs we've already purchased. And then uh, we also talk to the vendor, you know, kind of make it a, uh, you know, a really collaborative event, you know, allow the vendor to, you know, possibly challenge the researcher, challenge the, the results. Um, and so that it's all, you know, very, very, you know, transparent and people understand that what they're, what the, what we're buying and what we're looking at are some of the most advanced and, you know, aggressive zero days that, that are out there in the industry today. Transparent, and I won't ask you to throw anyone under the bus, but occasionally contentious as well, right? Uh, in terms of, did we know about it? Did did we really? What's the impact? And and there's quite a bit of discussion that goes on in that secret room, right, between you and the vendor and the contestant. Yeah, there's a lot of you know, a lot of discussion, a lot of debate about you know the severity of a specific vulnerability. I know Abdul, there was a there was some fun conversations we had uh, with with some of the engineers. They would call in and we'd start having discussions with them, um, you know, yeah. trying to, trying to decide you know you know how we were going to judge against this and whether they knew about it and what they you know classified it as you know whether it was a, a feature or yeah. it was actually a vulnerability. You know, um, yeah. do you have any any examples there, Abdul? Um, yeah, some some of the some of the engineers might uh, not really understand uh, the severity of a certain issue, and uh, they they might uh, basically just call it a feature or uh, it's not it's not a bug when it was part of the chain actually using the chain, uh, the exploit chain. So, yeah, uh, debates like that happen all the time inside the disclosure inside the disclosure room specifically. Now, I, I don't want to lose all the audience here. We do have some extremely technical people that watch, but a lot that aren't. But Abdul, the, the Triangle Microworks 
uh, vulnerability that Ali and his team found was very interesting to me because this was part of Triangle Microworks, a lot of people don't know, is the maker of the DNP3 stack that's used almost everywhere DNP3 is used. They have a, just a massive market share. A lot of people don't know they're running that stack because it's been OEM'd by the ICS vendor that they bought the product from. So his team actually found a way to get remote code execution on the product uh, that was in the competition. Maybe you can just, and, and it was also an example of having to chain a lot of things together. If, if you could try in, in somewhat simple terms to explain what they did. Sure. Um, so this is, this is one of my favorite chains. And I think it's one of the most fascinating chains that I've seen in, in Ponto, Miami. Um, so this chain was, was composed of, of two vulnerabilities. Um, the first vulnerability was uh, used uh, to disclose, uh, disclose memory, memory disclosure, and it exploited an uninitialized uh, memory vulnerability in, in, DMP3, uh, in the DMP3 implementation of Triangle Microworks. The second vulnerability uh, that was used was a type confusion in data sets and the way data sets were handled. Um, and that was used as part of the chain to, con to, to gain code execution in, in uh, Triangle Microworks, um, um, the DMP3 implementation. Um, now, what's nice about it is that uh, basically they, they use data sets um, for, to achieve certain exploitation primitives. Let's say um, they did use uh, certain heap spray techniques and stuff like that. And the, and, and the data sets were used to trigger vulnerabilities and to actually help in, in writing the actual exploits to, to gain certain primitives. Um, that was one of the of, of the nice and fascinating exploits that I've personally seen in, in Ponto in Miami. It was very well engineered. Um, it was uh, stable. It, it, it hit from the first time, uh, and it was fast as well. Well, and even if one doesn't understand all the things you just said there, I think what the audience should take from this is that they found many problems and found a way to link them together to achieve the end goal of remote code execution. And I think this sometimes can have an impact where a vulnerability is found and people will say, well, that, that doesn't really help you that much because you can't get access to that code. And, and people don't always think about, well, this is one vulnerability, but it doesn't necessarily mean that it's going to be used in isolation. Um, it was just a very vivid example of that, I thought. Um, but I did have a, a question because you guys put out a great blog entry on this, and, and we'll link to that for those who want the technical details. But one of the things in that blog entry was um, you wrote, part of the fix included disabling data sets in the gateway. And I was just wondering if there was any hidden message in that simple sentence. Like, did you think that was an invalid way of dealing with it? Did it take out needed functionality or was that just, uh, was, was that a legitimate way of dealing with the problem? I mean, it, it seems that data sets should not be um, used that often or by default or anything like that. It does make a lot of sense to disable data sets because first the vulnerabilities existed in, in the way data sets were handled. Plus, if you have data sets, then you're technically exposing yourself to further attack surface. Um, thus, you're exposing yourself to more vulnerabilities in that functionality. So it does make sense um, that, that part of the fix is basically disabled to disable data sets in general. OK. OK, that's good to know. And, and did we ever get a feel as to how widespread this was in the Triangle Microworks DMP3 stack? Like in, so obviously, the, the product you were working with had this problem. But then a lot of people have some elements of probably the similar code base integrated into all these different systems. So did this affect all the DMP3 stacks that they sell, or was this just this one isolated uh, product that we had access to for the competition? We didn't, we didn't actually look into that. We only tested that specific uh, product with that specific implementation. Mm. Okay, yeah, because I've asked some people about this and I've gotten various opinions as to, you know, some people said, well, of course, these elements are in all the stack and then other people say not necessarily. So I, I think anytime we're testing a protocol stack in the ICS world and probably in any world, it, it gets us uh, very interested in where this might actually filter down to and whether the fix actually filters down. Uh, let's Switching topics a little bit, 
uh, the winners. Who was the winning team again? Yeah, so the winning team was actually uh, the Insight team. Um, mm -hmm. and so it had been actually the first time that they had participated in any Pwned Own contest. Uh, you know, uh, Stephen Seeley, one of the members of that team, uh, you know, has been a ZDI submitter for, for a long time. So we, we knew him quite well. And he partnered up with Chris to, 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 to form Insight team and come out and, and, and participate in the contest together. And, you know, I remember, I remember like, you know, three days of competition and it all really came down to the end, you know, kind of some of the last exploits to determine the winner. And it was always very exciting at Pwned Own just to, you know, if you're watching the points and if you're actually paying attention to the game and the different shifting that's happening um you know it, it can be quite entertaining if you if you follow along with the with what's happening well and didn't was this a team that got one of the um when one of the flags or competitions whatever you call it with four seconds left was that those guys yes yes <laughs> yes that was uh that was quite stressful to be honest um, i was on stage running that tent with the, with the guys and uh everything failed just everything failed we had to change laptops we had to fire up multiple vms and we were getting the same error in the in the rockwell uh, vms which is basically if you load a file inside the application it's going to complain about licensing and stuff like that so in the end we 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 had that idea of basically running or giving the url basically they hosted the file on their own web server and uh, basically we loaded the url from inside the application and and that technically loaded the file remotely and it was like only four seconds left for the whole attempt to uh, to be done so that was that, that was quite stressful yeah. i remember that one and that ended up being if they didn't win that one they wouldn't have won the competition right correct because of that specific attempt they won the competition correct and how much money did they win total do you have that number um they uh, i think they won more than eighty five thousand dollars in total <laughs> It's quite a bit of money. Uh, it is. What What do these guys do? Are is this Are they professional vulnerability hunters, or do they work for organizations? What's What's their full time job, or do they have one? Uh, Stephen Stephen have been submitting to us for a long time. He's been um, you know a bug hunter for quite some time. Um, he has been doing this for for a living for um, a couple of years. I think now he uh, he joined uh, a company. Okay. I'm not, not going to disclose the name of it, but now he's a full-time employee doing also vulnerability research. Okay. Uh, but there are some people out there that their full-time job is finding these things and submitting them to ZDI and other people. Correct. I was, I was even one of these guys basically before I joined oh, really? ZDI. <laughs> yes. <laughs> um, so yeah, we do have submitters who this, this is what they do on it for, for a living, basically submit to us and find vulnerabilities. Okay. Well, do you have, before we move forward a little bit, do you have any, either one of you have any um, other comments about last year's S420 Pwn to Own, Miami's first edition? Any other comments about the competition that I, that I didn't talk about or things you found surprising? No, I mean, for us, I thought, you know, we had a great time at the event, you know, S4, you guys do a fantastic job with that conference. I mean, it was the first time I had, I had been to S4. Um, I had heard from it from, from some of the you know, researchers who've spoken there before from our company, Trim Micro, um, uh, and, and it was a great conference. I mean, I, there's definitely a great community out there, uh, people participating uh, in, in the event. I mean, it was a packed, you know, packed arena. So um, we, uh, you know, for us, it was, it was a lot of fun to, to, to be involved in the event. Um, um, you know, to bring our flavor of vulnerability and exploit intelligence to this community, you know, and, uh, and you know, we took, we learned a lot. And I think the next time we run the event, you know, it's going to be even smoother and, and we're going to, you know, invite more people to participate and get, uh, get people to uh, start looking at some of these products in, in more in depth. Well, it was a great addition to the event, to S4. I mean, just to have this in the room up front there at, on the main building, it really generated a lot of excitement and people who were in, in this area were watching and then other people would wander in and they couldn't believe such things were happening. So it, it generated a lot of excitement. We had done a, a capture the flag exercise for many, many years. And we kind of set that aside for this because there's a lot of ICS CTFs and what you guys are doing is real world. <laughs> yeah. Finding real problems and real products, not made up things. So I thought it was, it was great and I can't overemphasize, you mentioned it, but you guys were really busy. I mean, yeah. you guys, were, 
I think you even were doing some things during the cabana sessions and, and you guys were, I mean, three days was really, you cramped everything you possibly could into those full three days. Yeah, it's, it's kind of funny when we go through this, this event and we're running back and forth from the contest room to the disclosure room and, you know, basically nonstop. I know like, you know, some of the disclosures will go long. We have to adjust the schedule. Abdul, Abdul's, you know, running around uh, trying, to, trying to make things happen from the operational side of the house. I mean, it's, uh, it, was, it was a very busy week for that week. And, uh, you, know, I, you know, I look at it as like, you know, we're, we're probably only going to get bigger with all the excitement that was going on. So we have to plan for that. <laughs> well, and, and obviously we had, we had hoped to, I know from my side, and we had talked about it a little bit, we had hoped to do it this Janu January at S421, which of course was canceled for obvious reasons. Uh, if you're looking forward and you were doing this again, let's say we, you're going to do this in January 2022, have you given any thought to the types of targets you would not not necessarily specific products, but you know, are are you looking for harder targets, different targets? What would you be? What do you think the greatest value would be, both from uh, a, a ZDI perspective and and the community perspective? Yeah, I think for us, I, I think it, you know because you know this this contest is new to this space. I think we you know we I know Abdul and I like to partner with vendors, right? So we'd want to you know we invite vendors to to reach out to us if they want to be involved in the contest. You know, try to enable some of the the work against the PLCs. You know, try to get some more high profile targets in there. Maybe set it up in a in more real real world situations so that you know we can we can start targeting you know very specific sub components within the pieces of software. You know, uh, for us, it's you know we want it to be represented. Of, of what's out there in the world. And obviously we're gonna be working with industry experts like yourself, Dale, um, and, and to put it in the right direction, um, you know, and we welcome the vendors to come out and, and, and participate and put their software up to the test. You know, this is it's not an easy contest to be involved in. I mean, there's there's negative PR when the, when, when the, uh, when the you know, the attacks happen, but, you know, ultimately, you know, what we're doing is we're bringing out some of the most innovative and advanced research that is there, that, that exists in the world um, for free. I mean, we're not, you know, for the most part, not charging uh, charging the vendors to participate. You know, we're looking for it to be kind of a collaborative environment and we want to, uh, you know, help them engage the security community and bring that valuable research to them so that they can build defenses. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I already have some ideas, so I'll, I'll throw <laughs> some things out to you when, when the time is right. But I, I do think because we have some things that are low hanging fruit and some things that are insecure by design, I think it's nice to have i liked how we you had a representative set of products this year but i think the things that are exploitable through security perimeters that are often available through security perimeters and and also anything that's just widely deployed yep. because we're we're seeing through solar winds and and a lot of other things the the bad guys are getting smarter and they're looking for highly leveraged attacks where yes. They get this bug and, and it's not just this one organization, but they can get it across a whole sector or multiple sectors. So that's good. Well, I, I really appreciate you guys coming on the podcast. Even more, I appreciate you putting on the Pwn to Own Miami. It was a, a great event. It added a lot to it. I hope we can do it again. And, and thanks for being on the show. Absolutely. Thanks for having us. Thank you for having us. Welcome back to Pwn to Own Miami for 2020. We're entering our third and final day, and we've got a whole slate of amazing research to discover. The day began with quite a bit of drama, as Steven Seeley and Chris Anastasio of the Insight team took all but four seconds off the clock to get their code execution working on the Rockwell Automation Studio 5000. This heart-racing demonstration earned them $20,000 and 20 points towards Master of Pwn, and it certainly had everyone in the room sweating. Next up, the team from Clarity Research targeted a DOS exploit against the Triangle Microworks SCADA data gateway in the DNP3 category. They were able to successfully demonstrate their denial of service. However, the bug had been previously reported. This counts as a partial win and earned them two and a half Master of Pwn points. In his first Pwn to Own entry, Michael Stepankin of Veracode targeted the inductive automation ignition in the control server category. He was able to successfully demonstrate his code execution, but his bug had also been previously reported. This partial win did get him 12 and a half master of Pwn points. The Insight team returned, this time with a little bit less drama. They were targeting the OPC Foundation, 
OPC UA.NET standard framework, and were able to successfully create a denial of service condition. They earned themselves $5,000 and five points towards Master of Pwn. Those five points ended up being pretty important down the road. They came right back, this time targeting the Iconics Genesis 64 in the control server category. They used a deserialization bug to get code execution with continuation. That's another $25,000 and 25 points towards Master of Pwn. That put them in a commanding lead for Master of Pwn with an astonishing 92.5 points in total. The Clarity research team also wasn't done. They came back to use a combination of bugs to get code execution with continuation on the Rockwell Automation Factory TalkView SE. This earned them another $25,000 and 25 points towards Master of Pwn. Next up, Tobias Chernovsky, Nicholas Breitfield, and Ali Abbasi came back to target the Triangle Microworks Gated Data Gateway in the DMP3 category. They were successful in getting their code execution with continuation and this earned them $25,000 and 25 points towards Master of Pwn. That puts their total at 87.5 points. Ben McBride of the Oak Ridge National Laboratory returned to target the inductive automation ignition and the control server category. He was able to demonstrate his code execution, but his bug had previously been reported. He still earns 12.5 points towards Master of Pwn for this partial win. Our final entry of the entire contest was actually a Pwn Dome newcomer. Lucas Georges of Synactive took the stage to close out the contest by targeting the Rockwell Automation Factory Talk View SE in the HMI category. He was able to demonstrate his code execution, but his bug had been previously reported. He earns 12.5 Master of Pwn points for this partial win. That brings to a close our first ever Pwn Dome in Miami for 2020. Recapping the Master of Pwn points, Lucas Georges, Michael Stepankin, and Fabius Artrell each had 12 and a half. Ben McBride finished with 25 points. The Clarity Research Team had 65 points. The Flashback Team of Pedro Ribeiro and Radek Domanski finished with 75 points. In second place, Tobias Shonarski, Nicholas Breitfield, and Ali Abbasi had 87 and a half points. And the Master of Pwn winner for the first ever Pwn to Own Miami goes to the Insight team of Steven Seeley and Chris Anastasio with 92.5 points. Just five points separated the first and second place entries in the Master of Home competition. What a contest! Let's hear from the contestants themselves what they thought about the contest and some tips for future participants. First one is don't be afraid. There are a lot of people I know congratulating me for participating, and I know these people very well. I know they're very skilled, some even more skilled than me. And I asked them, why do you don't go? And it's, they find all kinds of, of excuses. You shouldn't be too afraid of the complexity. Just put in, be persistent, and you will have some emotional roller coasters. We sure had with uh, some of the exploits. We had to get very crafty in some places to actually get it. And I was very close to like dropping one of the exploits, for example. But then I was very happy about having a solution for that. Always be prepared for um, bug collisions. If you can have like multiple bugs, definitely, definitely try to achieve that. Don't feel defeated. Yeah. Just keep trying. You know, you, you know, you just gotta build it up. You know, you cannot reach here and get master mm -hmm. of phone. You gotta build it up slowly. Don't give up. Uh, definitely read as much of other people's work as you can. I, I love that ZDI has the blog post for select exploits that they let out. There's always a ton of good info in there. That brings to a close our first ever Pwn to Own Miami. It's been an amazing contest full of some amazing research. We want to thank all of the contestants. We want to thank our host, the S4 Conference. And of course, we want to thank all the vendors that participated. We'll see you in Canada in March for Pondo in Vancouver.